right. Good evening, everyone. We have a small but mighty group tonight. Um, we heard the rain might be keeping a few people out, but we've got both. But we've got folks both in person as well as on Zoom. Um, some of you who may have been in the meeting last quarter uh, know that we had some issues with our sound system. We've since worked on that, and we think that we have it down. So we've got a team here taking a look at it. So if you um, have any issues, go ahead and put that in the chat. Um, speakers, when we speak tonight, we're going to ask you all to come up here to the stage. The four microphones here will pick that up, and that way the folks on Zoom can see who's talking. Right, so tonight, uh, oh, I didn't look at that. What am I pointing at? <laughs> I already have my first glitch. Are you holding it up to me? Yeah. You want my clicker? We tested this clicker. Yeah. Hold, please. Yeah. Although the lights were me. No, we're going to move it back to me and we'll switch it out and put it in again. Good try. Nope. That's all right. You just um, what we're going to do. All right. So, so again, I said welcome. My name is Kristen Cook. I go by KC. I am part of the Nevada County Firewise Coalition Steering Committee. Um, I also head up the UVET Firewise community. Um, I think some of you know that we've moved to a quarterly format instead of a monthly. And those of us on the steering committee will be rotating. So you'll see a different face up here on a quarter over quarter basis. So tonight, um, we've got a couple of quick hits that we wanted to go through. And then we're going to move right into our partner reports and then into our feature topic which is emergency radios. Um, it's a topic near and dear to my heart. It's in my community. It's uh, without exaggerating, it's, it's literally a life-saving tool for us. So we're excited tonight to be able to have um, Mark from Aries, which is the amateur radio group, as well as three case studies from Firewise Communities presenting. Um, as a follow-up to that, Susan will be presenting the resource of the month, which will be about some of the documents. And then we're gonna just go ahead and have some Q&A and then wrap up. So with that said, um, quick hit. We're all FireWise team leaders in our neighborhoods, with our communities. The question that always comes up is what are the kinds of things that I should be doing at what time of year? So we started putting together, this is the second quarter, right? So it's spring. What are the kind of actions that we should be taking in our neighborhoods, with our properties, and within our communities to make them more fire safe. This is just a nice little kind of leave behind. Um, do you guys know you can get this content when it's all said and done? But we found it to be extremely helpful when talking to neighbors about what they could be doing, what they should be doing. One of the things that I keep pointing out to the UVAC community is that while, let's see if this works, while most of us are doing winter debris cleanup frantically, a lot of people forget about the landscape component of that. Um, if you're on larger parcels, it's important that you look beyond defensible space and at your, your property that um, lines the evacuation routes and the roads and things of that nature. So a couple heads heads nodding, uh, that's super important. So we break this down, like I said, to property work and then the fire ready tasks. Um, I've been involved in firewise communities now for a little over three years and Everything was very overwhelming to me at first. Um, get your go bag, sign up for code red, find your evacuation route, find your five, all these things. So, the, so here what we've done is kind of just break them down into some fire ready tasks that allow us to sort of have a checklist. Hi guys, welcome. So get radio ready is on that fire ready task. For those of you who are here to listen to the radio um, updates tonight, Host your neighborhood events. Spring is the busiest time of year for Firewise. Um, double check all your notifications. Sometimes those things expire, so you do need to encourage your neighbors to sign up again for Code Red or Watch Duty app or the, the tools of your choice. And last but not least, we all know we need to update our go bags. But I know that most of us procrastinate and it takes the first fire before we pull them out and realize my granola bars are outdated that I don't took my water out, I used my headlamp in the middle of the night chasing my dog. 
So it's important to make sure that we do go through those, even if we've had them a few years before. So that's it for the quick hit. Um, who, oh, I forgot. Next slide, please. <laughs> so what's working is not. Um, who wants to go first? Jim, Fire Safe Council. Put sure. on up here. Yeah. And Alex, you'll follow Jim. Hey, thanks for welcoming me back, everybody. Jim Mathias, I'm the Fire Prevention and Safety Coordinator Manager for the Fire Safety Council. So uh, that's a mouthful, right? Yeah. I'm really glad to be back. You know, I, I left for a while and now I'm back, and this is pretty exciting for me. So this is too important of a job for what we're doing to, to walk away from it. And so I'm just really happy to be here. But I do have a little story to tell you before I get going. I was going to say, where's the joke? I got it, buddy. I got you. I got you covered. <laughs> so this <laughs> snail, he walks into an elite car shop, Ferraris, Tesla, the Ferraris, Lamborghinis, Bugattis, all the high-end super fast cars. And he walks the salesman and he goes, hey, what's the fastest car you got to walk? And this guy says, a Bugatti with all these letters after it that I would never understand. And he goes, how much is it? This is 1.5 million. So the snail goes, okay, I'll buy it on one condition. You have to paint a big S on the side of it. And the salesman goes, Mr. Snail, are you sure you want to take this car and just paint a big white S on the side of it? And he says, yeah, when I drive down the road, I want people to say, look at that S car go. Okay, well, <laughs> that's the fun stuff. Uh, let's let's talk about the work that we have to do, right? The Fire Safety Council is a nonprofit working with you folks, trying to get this work done in Nevada County. It's it's that time of year. It's spring. We've had a lot of rain. Uh, I, I won't be able to tell you what happens this year. I just know that there's a lot of rain, right? And that means that a lot of stuff is growing. So we're here to provide whatever assistance that we can. And so with our partners in Nevada County, we're working on a few different programs. We've got the CAL FIRE grant. Uh, that's the fire prevention grant from CAL FIRE. It's, uh, it reduces the greenhouse gases. It helps with the economy, and it really helps with public health, all by reducing fuels uh, and, and hopefully reducing in the threat of wildfire, right? So that's what we're trying to do. And the programs that we have are the free green waste disposal. That's the big one, right? It's going on. I left flyers out there because I'm not going to recite all the dates. They're all listed here. Uh, half of the stack on the back of it has it in Spanish. If you know of anybody in your communities that would be more comfortable reading Spanish, we have those flyers in the back as well. So you can get rid of that green waste by bringing it there. Now, here's a little problem we're having. We're having a big, big problem with people just coming by and leave it in front of the gate. Just it, It's free waste, folks. We do it on Sundays and Mondays. We'll help you unload it. Please talk to your folks around. It's illegal to dump that stuff there. It really makes it hard for us because when we go to open it, now we have to move the pile before we can get in there and do the work. So it, it's just, I mean, it's just not a good way to be a good human being. So it's illegal and it's uh, it's not cool. So there's that. What we do with that stuff, some of it is going to be made available for you for and, and all the regulations for how big it can be and what you can bring. They're all the flyer. They're all there uh, and also on our website too. Mulch and ship delivery is also happening. So if you want free mulch, you can contact us and we can help you work that out because we're trying to get rid of that stuff too. And we want people to, if you can utilize it, utilize it. So that program, the flyers are also back there for that. We're a nonprofit. So we work off of memberships as one of our fundraisers. There's two different membership levels, the $99 and the $249. Those flyers are back there. Please support us as much as you can. Um, and then some other things that we've got going on is we're working on a couple of big projects in Nevada County. The South County Fuel Break kind of runs between Lake of the Pines and Alta Sierra. That's well underway. We're having a really good success. 
It's a road site. We're clearing each side of a few roads in, in uh, Southern Nevada County, creating a fuel break and escape routes and things like that. It's well underway. It's looking really good. It's a bunch of property owners that are participating and they're going to maintain it for years to come. So good things happening there. Uh, we're also working on uh, some reducing some fuels above, above Highway 20 with the, the Forest Health Grant, uh, up Highway 20 towards Washington, towards North San Juan, that whole corridor up there. So another large grant and stuff that we're working on. Last thing that I'm just going to mention before I turn it over to my partner, Pat, is that uh, we're working on, wow, a CWPP, the interim CWPP. The, the county is working on the long-term, really deep dive CWPP. We're working with them on an interim one that we can put out there because that's how we get more grant funding. Anybody in Nevada County that wants to do grant funding, they need some kind of direction for CWPP. So we're hoping to fire one out a little bit. CWPP. Oh, yeah, don't give the jargon, right? <laughs> Community Wildfire Protection Plan. So it's a plan for where all the hazards are, how we can mitigate them and cooperate with each other and use the, the environment mm -hmm. and think about the environment when we're reducing those fuels. So all good stuff. Sorry about the jargon. And I'll turn it over to my partner, Pat. I'll be here all night if you have any questions about this. Thank you, Tim. Pat, okay. Good to go. Hi, everybody. It's, it's really great to see so many Firewise community uh, leaders on tonight. I've been missing some of you. It's been so busy. But I want you to know that we now have 90 Firewise communities in Nevada County. Um, we've just recently, this year, added Wampum Level over off of Oak Tree, West Hacienda near uh, Combe and Magnolia, Black Ledge at Pleasant Valley Road, John Bourne at Pleasant Valley Road, and Sunnyvale Lane at Allison Ranch. So our map is filling out with a lot of pink, but we always seem to have another two dozen that are working towards it. Thank you everybody for doing such a great job with this. But we have something fun coming up and that's the Firewise Together fundraiser. This is the first time we're trying to do a fundraiser in this method. And uh, I do hope that we see at least a couple of people from most of our Firewise communities. It will be Saturday, June 3rd at Lake Wildwoods Commodore Park. And that's a nice big area so we can see a couple of thousand people there. Don't think it will be too crowded. We're gonna have games with prizes from one to 4.30. And then we'll have between five and nine, there will be happy hour, a silent and live auction, a live band and a fabulous barbecue dinner. And then we'll end the evening with Firewise community recognitions and grants. Now, everybody has been asking me, how do you apply for the grant? You apply for the grant by buying a ticket or donating something to the auction. Um, so all the information is on our website, areyoufiresafe.com. That's where you can purchase tickets too. So let's come on out. We're gonna have some special guests that mm -hmm. night too. And um, I just wanna celebrate with all of you. And let's just have some fun time and then take a little funds back to our Firewise communities to do all the work that we like to do. And that's my report tonight. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Pat. And uh, our little clicker thing's not working very well. I do have a slide coming up that shows the Firewise flyer, but I think you've all been hearing pretty much about it. So we'll, we'll underscore that. All right, next up, Alex OES. 
Office of Emergency Services. Of Emergency Services. What you got for us tonight? Oh, I've got so much, but I wrote it down, so I wouldn't go too long. <laughs> um, and for those of you who haven't signed a media release, um, I'll try to drop them on my way out. But we are capturing some video footage this evening to create a short film that really celebrates community-based land and stewardship, firewise communities, to kind of inspire folks who aren't already participating in this way to participate. And it'll run as a trailer at Sierra Cinemas over the summer and really just try and inspire people to take action. So that's what the filming's about and that's what the media releases are about. So I will start off on outreach. Um, we're gearing up for a robust outreach season. We will be out at the first Friday art walks and summer nights in Nevada City, also at Thursday Night Market in Grass Valley. Um, we are working with Fire Safe Council to produce a coordinated Ready, Set, Go handbook this year, and that'll hit about July. So you can be looking for that at the outreach events this summer and then also in your mailbox. Um, for those of you who are not aware, this Saturday is the 18th Annual Health, Safety, and Wildfire Preparedness Carnival. It's taking place at the Root Center from 11 to 4. If you haven't been, or if you have young people in your life, or hey, I mean, I got a kick out of seeing the helicopter land last year. It's a really great event. It's free. There's a ton of resources. I encourage you to come out to that. Um, if you're looking for something to do on Monday evening, May 8th at 7 p.m. in Nevada City, there's a screening of the film Elemental, and that is going to be followed by a panel of some local wildfire mitigation experts. There's going to be uh, Pat from Fire State Council will be there, folks from Yuba Bear Burn Cooperative, the representative of the Colfax Hog Valley Miwok Agricultural Foundation, talking about the use of fire on the land. It's my privilege to be able to moderate that panel. It'll be a great opportunity to learn more about some projects happening in Nevada County. So if you're looking for a fun Monday night thing. Um, and finally, um, the outreach room, I urge you to attend the May 23rd Board of Supervisors meeting. We will actually be having a proclamation celebrating the Firewise Together event that Pat Leach spoke of. We also have several other key items on the docket in for OES and we'll be giving presentations including planning. So I'll move on to planning. Um, we are excited that we've identified the consultants for three different planning efforts that we've secured grant funding for. One is the community wildfire protection plan update. One is the local hazard mitigation plan update. And the third is the evacuation study. So at that May 23rd meeting, We'll be giving a presentation about what are these plans, why are we doing them, how it is strategic to be doing all three of them at the same time. So that'll be an opportunity to learn more about that. Um, as Jim mentioned, Fire State Council is doing an interim CWPP. Ours is a bit more robust of an effort. We've completed the wildfire hazard assessment, which is a component of the local hazard mitigation plan and also the CWPP. But after the May 23rd board meeting, you can look toward a community survey that will be rolling out. And basically the way a CWPP works is you first look at what are the hazards on the landscape, but then you look at what's important to the people who live on that landscape. So what are the high value resource and, and assets that are at risk? And so that's where this community survey comes in because we really want to hear from you What's important to you on this landscape? Because it's not just about where we know things are hazardous, but what do we want to protect? And that's really community-based. So more to come on that. In terms of program, we are really excited that we've hired our lead defensible space inspector. His name is Ricky. He came out of code compliance in Nevada County. He was also an integral member of the EOC, the Emergency Operations Center. So he's well vested in emergency operations. We have also been interviewing temporary defensible space inspectors. And shout out to Pat, who has really been really supportive of the DSI team um, since Roger Tucker has left us, and we've had a bit of a void there. So thank you, Pat, for all that you do. Finally, grants. <laughs> uh, so we've got a lot of grants right now. We've actually got 14 grants representing $11 million of investment in wildfire mitigation in Nevada County. 
Um, we just wrapped up phase one of the access and functional needs program, which was in partnership with Fire Safe Council. Um, Jim mentioned South County Shaded Fuel Break. That's another project that's in partnership with Fire Safe Council. So I'm just going to hit the high points of the six grant awards we've gotten since March. So Ponderosa West Phase Two and the South County Fuel Break. This is a Phase One planning project. It's funded by FEMA. Because we've already got South County underway, we're requesting that FEMA allow us to rescope that project to build out Ponderosa Phase Two, and we're looking at adding about a thousand acres to that project area. Second one, Ponderosa Maintenance. We're really excited about this one. This was a congressionally directed spending request. So an earmark request that we put in last year. It has been granted, which means we write a, basically a proposal to US Forest Service to administer those funds. $750,000 will allow for maintenance of the Ponderosa Phase One project. So we're excited about that. Maintenance money is hard to come by. We really got to do it every two to three years or within five we're back to you know kind of ground zero again south uber rim this is a planning project that was awarded by the sierra nevada conservancy two hundred and fourteen thousand dollars in partnership with the watershed institute we're hoping to use that funds as the 25 percent match for a fema hazardous mitigation grant program proposal that we have in we can do the project as a one-off without the FEMA funds. It would be more strategic with um, roadside vegetation abatement. One was last Friday, I want to say. Um, this is a $1 million FEMA project. It's the planning aspect for what will end up being 300 miles of roadside vegetation abatement in both West and East Nevada County. That's in partnership with our Department of Public Works. We got a community welfare defense grant for $250,000. We're pairing that with $90,000 from the California Fire Safe Council grant. That is going to pay for our CWPP update, which everyone keeps telling me I need to come up with a better word than the full enchilada. <laughs> it's the roadmap to resilience. But our CWPP is not just going to be a document. It's going to be a land management plan that will provide this sort of toolbox of locally vetted best practices for doing wildfire mitigation work on different landscapes, different topography, different vegetation assemblages. And then we're going to have an interactive project dashboard where you can literally go on there and say, I'm interested in wildfire mitigation that addresses a watershed need and maybe a sensitive species. And here's where I live. And we'll be able to turn layers on and off and see where that sweet spot is to design the project that you're hoping to achieve. So we're really excited about the CWPG funding. And finally, yesterday, we learned that Cal Fire funded our winter storm hazardous vegetation cleanup grant for $950,000. This will allow for roadside cleanup of storm debris on about 100 miles of county maintained roads. It's got almost an equal amount of funding, $310,000, to directly support private roadway cleanup um, for those private roads that were especially badly impacted. And it will add funds to bolster green waste that Fire Safe Council is leading both east and west by the county. Yeah, <laughs> that's a lot of work. <laughs> Excited about it. We're not possible without partnership with So thank you. Wow, Alex, that's insane. So, what, 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 before I call you up, Patrick, one thing I just want to put a little bow on. I think um, those of us who've been around for a while have really seen both the Fire Safe Council and the Office of Emergency Services um, start to add a lot more staff and start to collaborate real strongly with all the entities across the county. That's one of the key things that I think is going to help those of us who, you know, on the ground residents, right, is that they are working together better, even though they've always had great relationships toward the bigger picture, which is how do we get more money driven into the county to do more projects. So, you know, a lot of times I listen to these things and I never, I never hear my community mentioned once, but at the same time, rising tide floats all boats. And this is an overtime proposition. You know, we've got ourselves in a hole, not anyone's fault here. And it's going to take years to get out of it. And as Alex said, to maintain it. So thanks to all the big efforts on that. 
Patrick, if you want to come up and give us a couple brief updates. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, my name is Patrick Mason. Mm -hmm. I'm the fire marshal with the County Consolidated Fire District. Uh, I partner with the Nevada County Consolidated Fire District, partner with OES, and I oversee the boots on the ground physical space inspectors. Um, some of the areas we are currently working in, I have the VSI inspectors out in the Rollins Lake area, out on all the private roads, helping to get the education out there before we really get into campus. Actually, starts to pick up. Another area there in there up off Tyler Foot Road. Also, and all these are proactive educational inspections, meaning they're not opening cases. They're just knocking on doors and trying to educate the homeowners on what the hazardous vegetation is. Um, along with what Alex mentioned, we, at the same time, we also have the new hazardous vegetation ordinance. It's gone through the two readings at the Board of Supervisors, and it will be adopted here. <clears throat> the biggest change with that ordinance is Everything improved or unimproved parcels, or every parcel that's improved like one acre or less, we're going to ask them to treat the entire parcel. So we try to look at something that was kind of in the middle of vacant open land. We have a lot of vacant land here in Nevada County. What can we do? Um, we decided to start at the one acre and see how that works out. And they will do On the fire district side, we did receive a grant, uh, $15,000 last year for green waste bins. We're placing green waste bins out in the community. We have the application for, that for a while. Um, I was hoping to get 15 bins out, so far I'm up to 19 bins, and I still have room to get a couple more. So uh, if you live within the Nevada County Consolidated Fire District, and it's a community bin, it's for ingress, egress along the private roadways, uh, feel free to reach out to me, Patrick Mason at nccfire.com, and uh, See if I can't come out and take some photos, meet with you, get a 40 yard green waste bin put into your community. And also at the same time, I always try to make myself available if anybody has any questions, wants me to come out and just leave their property with them at any time. We'll schedule something, I'll come out and spend a couple hours with you. Let's walk your property, give you some ideas, some suggestions, and uh, different mitigation factors that you might be able to take. So. Feel free to take that, reach out to me. You can call the admin office or uh, hit me up on the email. That's it up for you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. I'm going to um, pass by Cal Fire. Matt, was, Matt Wallen was supposed to be here tonight, but he had a four o'clock incident. Um, he is on Zoom. So oh, he is on Zoom. I'm, I'm here. Oh. Yeah. Hey, Matt. Can, can, oh. can you hear me okay? Well, how about a Cal Fire update? Sure, you got it. Um, well, with our with regards to our staffing, we are we we tear up and tear down every every year, and we're in our second level of up staffing right now. We have um, about seven state engines covered throughout the unit at the moment, um, state funded engines, as well as uh, we've transitioned some of our Amador agreements uh, to our state mission status which means uh, like Higgins Fire Protection District, um, who we support in the wintertime on an Amador agreement, we're now back to state staffing there, as well as uh, Loma Rica in Yuba County. So we do, <clears throat> we are, that's our usually our first typical uh, tier of upstaffing. Our next uh, level of upstaffing is going to be June uh, 5th. And we anticipate, now this could be weather dependent, but um and isn't this weather great i'm so happy <laughs> um uh june 5th we anticipate the date being what we call level three staffing which is uh, just one not shy of our uh, july staffing but june 5th we look at going to one engine per station and uh one tanker at the air base um another thing that i learned today at our nevada county chiefs meeting uh this morning is that um our deputy chief had mentioned we are getting a the past several years we've had a region type one helicopter one of the big uh chinook uh, aircraft and it's been assigned typically up to the the Truckee, uh airport but this year with the snow being what it is they anticipate staffing that well probably all the way into july 
down here at the Grass Valley Air Base. Um, so that's that's kind of hot off the press. So that'll be one more available aircraft that we'll have in addition to a contract aircraft that our unit has a, an exclusive use agreement with a, with a private aircraft, which is a, a smaller type two helicopter um, that has a bucket. And that one's gonna be supported out of uh, Auburn. So we've been very fortunate with the aircraft that we're getting. Um, and then we'll probably be going to um, three dozers at that time. <clears throat> and probably two on a 24. Uh, so we're looking really good there. We have, a, we have several new dozer operators to, uh, to meet our mission. We're actually gonna have again this summer, a fourth dozer assigned to the region. And right now it's slated for um, being a second dozer out of Nevada city, but it may move um, down to the front country just due to the fire behavior um, early on with the fuels drying down there more quickly. Um, <clears throat> one other thing I wanted to mention is um, our agency's having a, a bit of a, of a growing pain with a new introduced, newly introduced electronic program version of filing for your um, residential. And um, I'd like to clear it up by calling the other type of fire permit, you know, a commercial permit. And we should almost word it that way. And, and the reason I'm mentioning that is um, in the past, those, those commercial permits, I might have had maybe three to six a year that I would go and do an inspection on, on for a large, uh, a large parcel burn. And um, this year, um, in the last two days, I've gotten about 25. And there, I think there's a little bit of miscommunication um, in that people people are um, signing up for these commercial burn permits and it's and the reason I mentioned the term growing pains is we're probably not going to have the staffing to get to those qu as quickly as we'd like to um, just for the inspection process that uh, you know the battalion chiefs need to go out and do and so I'm I'm, I'm frustrated because I always want to keep the public happy and and you know, have our department be on always viewed as top notch and, and um, we're trying to do the best we can to uh, meet this new permitting process. So um, if any of you personally or know of anybody applying for, for these larger burn scale, um, the LE5 or LE7, um, it's, we're off to a, a little bit of a delayed start in getting those approved, but we're gonna work through them as quickly as we can. But Quite honestly, I don't think we anticipated the surge of those um, that have come through the electronic um, application process. So uh, I know in our upper, our upper management is uh, becoming aware and we're trying to figure out what our next move's gonna be to uh, basically get as many people to do, to do the burning they need to do for fire clearance. Um, so uh, again, I would call it a growing pain and anything new is always a little bit difficult to get going, but, but we'll get through it. We'll be fine. Um, I just hope people don't get too frustrated in the process. So if you, I guess bottom line, the reason I wanted to mention it. Yes, because Matt, can you clarify? What's it? Can you clarify sort of like the everyday household? We want a burn permit. We're no longer an open burning. We want to apply for a burn permit. What is it that you want us to look at online? What's what's the, the right thing that we should be signing up for? Most people will be signing up for what's called the LE62 or the residential permit. It's what folks used to come into the fire station to get and they okay. were good for up to two years. Um, that's really the message I would like to have passed on. Um, where it gets a little sketchy is, is people are going, well, I have three piles that are like eight feet in diameter. And I just want to tell them, well, that's close enough, but I can't because it's, you know, it's, it's not meeting the written verbiage of how things are. And we haven't changed that yet. And I don't know that there is a plan to change it, but I mean, that, that's kind of the delay and it's, it's kind of frustrating. So 
most people should need to apply for what's called the residential dooryard burn permit process. And uh, it doesn't require an inspection. You watch a three to four minute video. It educates uh, you on, this, on the hazards and the assumed liability of burning. And then you, uh, you get to go on your way and you'll get a permit. Unfortunately, there's been a few glitches there too. Uh, I had heard one got, was issued until May 1st of this year and then it was no longer good. And so, um, and really May 1st is the time that we require them. May 1st, all the way up to July 1st, if we are able to extend the burn window that long, and that's again, weather dependent. But um, yeah, that's what most people are gonna need. I mean, if you have, you know, realistically one to three acres or, or less than that, that's, you could you could feasibly do what you need to uh, with time and, um, you know, uh, arranging your piles so that they're isolated and not going to spread anywhere. Um, so I, I don't want to bend folks' ear too much tonight on that, but I just kind of wanted to close up with um, with that process and just um, hopefully there will be some patience for those that do need a larger burn. I'm talking like 20 to 30 foot diameter piles, or they want to do a uh, a broadcast burn on their property and just uh, cordon off the whole area and light it on fire, which most people don't have enough guts to do, including me sometimes. But, um, you know, uh, those are the commercial, and I wish we'd almost use that term because I think it would steer people in the more correct direction. But those are the commercial applications for treating with fire. So, um, but you know, most of us, most of us listening tonight are probably going to want that LE 62 and that'll get you on your way burning tomorrow versus having to wait, you know, up to two weeks for us to come out and be able to, um, to visually inspect and go over the process with you. Um, and yeah, and all the other duties we have such as escape control burns and car accidents and house fires and everything else. So um, yeah, we're pretty busy, but uh, that's, all, that's all I have for the Cal Fire update uh, for tonight. Um, and uh, I'll be around for any questions at the end. Thank you, Matt. Um, appreciate that and, and good news for those of us in Western County with the uh, big Chinook being here until July. It's always a Nice to have our air attack base fully staffed. Um, anybody here for the reports that I've missed online? I think we're I think we're we're good. All right, can you do a slide forward for me? So Pat Leach had mentioned the fundraiser for the Firewise communities. Um, this is what she's referring to. And I just wanted to underscore one thing. I had somebody you can buy all kinds of tickets and packages, and someone said to me, Wow, seventy-five dollars for a barbecue. That's an expect an expensive dinner. And my response was, "It's a fundraiser, and the money's going back to Firewise communities." So, if you see it in your hearts, you're able to attend. Great. If not, hopefully you can encourage some neighbors. Um, my key thing I'm talking to my neighbors about is the more folks from UVet who sign up, the more chances we get in the raffle for prizes. So, do pass that on to your Firewise uh, community. Oh, it worked. Hold on, let me, let me, let me try it. Yeah, it's back up. We're, we're in business. All right, so now we're here for our feature topic. Um, before we kick off, I just want to kind of lay it out for y'all because it, we have four presenters tonight. So the idea here is that the emergency radios that Mark from Aries and his team launched last year, um, there's been some success. So he's going to update us on how many Firewise communities in Nevada County have embrace this program um, and a little bit about that. And then we have three presenters who will be talking about what their Firewise community did, how they did it, and their key learnings from it. So we'll be building on that story. So the idea is at the end of this, um, if you're considering launching a program like this, you don't know if it's for you or for your, your friends or neighborhoods, um, this should give you a lot of insight and information to make those decisions and also will provide you with a lot of ideas and tools on how to go about it. Without further ado, Mr. Mark Triel, take it away. Thank you, Keith. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am Mark Triel, and uh, here tonight I'm representing the ARIES organization. I 
um, which stands for Amateur Radio Emergency Services. We are a volunteer organization that is uh, in existence to provide emergency backup communication for county agencies like the Red Cross and like you know, OES in Nevada County. So we serve both of those agencies with backup communication services if needed. Um, tonight, I'm here to talk about the Neighborhood Radio Watch program, which we created about a year ago. And if you could go to the next slide. Um, so what this program is and does is it, it's a training program that we've created uh, for county neighborhoods, specifically to train those neighborhoods on how to use radios, handheld radios, to talk to each other in an emergency. Um, specifically talk to each other and to get information about what's happening with the event so they can make good decisions about what they need to do to protect their personal safety. Um, this all, of course, is only important when normal communications are down, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, I mentioned us again, our expertise, we're a volunteer group, but our expertise is in communication, so we know how to use the equipment and we know how to communicate. And having a radio doesn't mean you know how to communicate. They're kind of different things. Um, this is a free service. I'll underline that. Um, you do need to buy a radio, but the service itself is being offered on a volunteer basis by Aries, and there is no fee to take this class. Um, the goal of this entire um, effort is really to increase your personal safety during an emergency event like a fire, or a snowmageddon. And it kind of looks like we're gonna have more of those based on the way the climate is going these days. So that is really the goal is to improve the safety of you, your family, and your property. And then secondarily, um, it might even lower your stress because being able to talk to your neighbors during one of those events hopefully will make you feel a little bit better about your personal safety. Uh, next one. Great. Um, so why is this important to anybody listening to this conversation? Well, it's because we all have come to take for granted our normal communications. We all have a cell phone right here and we think it's like on all the time. And usually it is. However, um, it may not be on all the time during one of those emergency events. And by normal communications, I mean cell phones, internet, landlines, and texting. Um, these might go down for one of two reasons, either the infrastructure will be physically damaged, um, similar to this really nice looking cell tower. They did a great job on that, didn't they? Unfortunately, they built it very close to the trees and it burned down. Um, more commonly though, these systems go down because they lose power. So either PG&E shuts that off in advance um, or fire takes the infrastructure out and they lose power. They only have limited battery backup, very limited. I think you're all coming to kind of see this now with the last few snowmageddon, sometimes power doesn't return for days or even weeks. So the whole purpose of this program is to set you up so you have battery operated radios that don't need power, they don't rely on any outside infrastructure, and you can talk to people in your neighborhood and stay up to date on what you need to do to protect your personal safety. Uh, next one, please. Um, we kind of break the um, the use. So how can you use these radios? And now you know why. Well, how would you use them? We kind of break it down into three areas. Keeping up on what's happening in your neighborhood, making a personal aid request, and coordination during evacuation. So by this one, we really mean getting information within your neighborhood about where is the fire, which direction is it going, which way is the wind blowing, um, has our evacuation zone been called yet? How close are the evacuation zones to my area being called? Um, and also staying up to date on um, the major conduits of communications to the public, which would be radio stations. You can always also listen to CAL FIRE and other civil agencies. Stay very up to date on what the status is with the local event. Um, by personal aid requests, we mean your father-in-law is in town in a wheelchair, you cannot get him in the car. You can make an immediate call to a couple of your neighbors because you need some horsepower to get him in the car. Those neighbors could come running to your house and give you a hand with that. And then lastly, since it's battery operated, you can take it in the car and check on local road conditions on your way out of town. So it 
pretty much breaks down into these three major categories in terms of how you would use this equipment to help yourself. Um, as Casey pointed out, uh, we've been running this program for about a year. And here's what we've done thus far. We have trained up eight neighborhoods. So these neighborhoods have gone through the entire program. It's not very long. It's two to three meetings of about an hour and a half each. So by program, I don't mean some lengthy thing. Um, all eight of these neighborhoods have been trained up, um, totaling about 120 people. So we basically have 120 people that now have equipment and know what to do with it. And it represents these eight. Um, you're going to hear from three of these in just a moment about their personal experience, some of the things they've learned about implementing this. And lastly, thank you. You're just too quick. Yeah. Yeah, I just glanced that it was there. Um, so if you're interested in pursuing more information about this, the um, best way to do that is to probably contact me, and I can work with you very quickly on the phone and determine if it's a good fit for you. Um, and you can contact me at this email address. Um, secondarily, you can go to our ARIES website, which is Nevada County ARIES, A R E S dot O R G. And there is a section in there called Neighborhood Radio Watch. It does have this address in it, and it's got an outline of all of the things I've covered here tonight, and that you will be hearing from the other three presenters. So, you go to NevadaCountyAries.org and or give me a call. We can pretty quickly narrow down whether this is a good fit for you. And if so, how would we proceed? And that website is now linked from the coalition website. And I'll be demonstrating that at the end of the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. All right. Up next, Lorraine. Hey everyone, this is Sue here and I'll tell you about our experience with the Gold Hill neighborhood and radio watch program. Gold Hill is located in just outside the city limits of Grass Valley. We're at the bottom of Highway 174, Fax Highway there. Um, and Maureen, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you the microphones are out here. There's four of them, so stay close to the edge and talk to the microphones as much as you can. Okay, thanks. Um, we have 87 acres and 175 parcels. So the Empire Vine State Historic Park surrounds much of our neighborhood. You'll see we've also got the Bennett Meadows on one edge and then some private forests on the other. So we're fairly surrounded by forest and meadows. Um, so this is just sort of how it went for us. Our neighborhood started having our first firewise discussions last July. Oh, my colors are all different. Work out so well. Um, I, that was right around the time when I learned about the ARIES program, and I became very interested in that and contacted Mark right away. Um, in August, and I just made a flyer and went door to door at my whole neighborhood, um, put one on every doorstep, and we had a good response. Uh, so we had our very first meeting with Mark um, in September. Uh, and then in uh, October, we had our first Firewise community meeting. So our radio group and our Firewise effort are sort of getting started on parallel tracks. We aren't actually an official Firewise community yet, close. So we are moving on parallel tracks and overlapping. Um, we had our second radio meeting where we got trained in how to use the radios in October. And then a few days later, we had our first NET, which is the word for meetings on the radio. Uh, and then we've um, settled into having these nets twice a month. Uh, this is our first uh, Firewise community meeting that we held in the neighborhood. And uh, a lot of the people there were, at, by that point, um, in, involved with the radio group So why did, were people interested in this? Um, it was because of fire. A lot of people are actually quite anxious about the fire, as everyone <laughs> knows. Uh, but it wasn't just fire. There's a lot of things to be anxious about these days. And, you know, extreme weather and all kinds of other uh, unrest. So it was just safety, mostly. 
Um, and this was a quote I put on the flyer that I used to advertise it is from a political scientist that said that it is the personal ties among members of the community that determine survival during a disaster and recovery in its aftermath. So very true. Yeah. So that's sort of why we were doing it. So now we have uh, 12 households with 16 active participants, there's a lot of uh, couples that are involved. And so what we've learned, um, one of the things, and it's really high on people's list, is that it's just um, for established relationships in the neighborhood. Uh, we're more connected, we know each other better now, and uh, makes people feel safer. So that's a big value. Um, and then we've our communications now go beyond the radios. Uh, we we established a, a you know a text uh, message uh, uh, communications, and we use that quite a lot. And we've used it during the you know the snow situations that we've had. And we're we're looking into using WhatsApp also because there's you can have groups on that. So we want to have WhatsApp group just for our whole neighborhood so we can communicate better. Um, but, you know, things like what roads are open, can you get to Safeway, how did the plow come through, what was that noise, it was a tree coming down, you know, all that we're doing now with our texting, but we, we got started as a group through the radio. Uh, what we've learned, maybe it's weird, it takes a while to get used to. Um, what I do in my group is I'm having each person be what's called net control, one who facilitates the conversation on the radio. Sometimes it's just one person that does it every meeting, but I'm having everybody uh, do it so they have experience um, doing that. And they just take more ownership in the whole group and uh, understand what's involved. Um, I thought two times a month meeting might be too much for people, but you know, there's a lot of us older people that aren't so we didn't, we're born with the electronics in our DNA and how to work it. So people want to get uh, experience using the equipment ready. Um, it was really helpful for me to visit Casey at her you bet a road to home and sit in on that because the jargon is different. How you talk on the radio, what do you say? Just to get comfortable with how it all works. And uh, you can also listen in on the um, nets held by Aries and the ham radio groups just to hear how those people on the net. Um, we also have a ham radio operator in our neighborhood, and they're a member of Aries. And Aries has somebody at the emergency control center. So our ham radio operator in our neighborhood has direct access to the OES. Center. So that gives us another great line of communication. Other than that, all we have is a banner repeater. So that gives us a really great line of communication. So having a ham radio operating group is a good thing. Uh, so things that are you still want to do, um, we still haven't worked out a good way or plan to communicate with everybody else in the neighborhood during an emergency. Like, how are we going to get the word out and what the plan is for evacuation or things like that? Um, we're still young and have things to develop. Um, I think we need to have some practices with staged emergencies because learning how to talk on the radio is much different than learning how to respond in emergencies. So I'm uh, hoping we'll get some practice with that. And then I'd like to, I know we have a lot of folks in our in our neighborhood that are retired emergency response folks, um, retired military, and I want to just plug them into our group so that we can access their skills um, when and when. Uh, and then recommendation, I'm hoping for more cross fertilization with the different radio groups. We can learn a lot from each other. And then I just wanted to say, I've kind of geeked out on some handouts for my group. Um, so I learn better by reading and you know, sometimes we need to refer to it quick to remember what this button is for on the radio or whatever. So. I've got a lot of um, simple handouts that I'm happy to share with you another so started. And Lorraine, those are on the website now, all four of your handouts, and I'll be showing that in oh, the resource of the month. Yeah. That's great. Thank you.
Thank you, Lorraine. Um, if anybody has questions, just hold them till the end. We'll be doing all things radio after all four presentations. So, Carrie, you're up next today. Curious about Air Jordan. Where yeah. did that come from? <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, uh, that's just a teaser. Hi, I'm Carrie Rose. I'm uh, with the Deer Creek uh, Southside Firewise community. And uh, we, a while back, saw a presentation by Mark uh, during one of these meetings right now about Aries. And um, uh, so we got, I got excited about that. And I'll tell you why in a second. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview. Just I'll talk about myself briefly, just for some context, what our community is like, why we wanted the radios, what our current status is, very similar format to what you just saw in here. But working with hidden and, and some <laughs> suggestions for other groups that might be interested. Who am I? Uh, my background is in audio and music and technology, so I like things with knobs and dials and lights, and cables and all that kind of stuff. So I just had a, and I used to have walkie talkies as a kid, so I was I just like that kind of stuff. I work my current day job working real estate, uh, and uh, part of my job too is just understanding just the lay of the land, what's going on in the community. I've acted before in previous communities I've lived in. Um, we had a uh, West Marin, we had our first responders, uh, community liaisons, and we actually had the fire department radios. We were meant to basically be boots on the ground for people because it's a very similar situation. Um, and in fact, about the fire department there was volunteer. And so we all had to kind of to step up. Uh, and so I just kind of got to my, my, my father-in-law's a Emeryville firefighter for 20 years. And so part of it is just, just being interested in caring about this stuff. Currently a committee member uh, in Deer Creek Southside Firewise, and then I'm now a self-appointed Air Jordan manager, and I'll tell you what Air Jordan is in a second besides a basketball shoot. So, um, so here's our Firewise community, Deer Creek Southside Firewise. So this is, this upper line is basically Deer Creek. Uh, Pine Street Bridge is roughly there, Tribulation Trail. Uh, and it extends all the way down to Providence Mine and, and back down to Deer Creek that way. Um, basically, Zion Street is the other border. Um, but we're going to go to the next slide uh, just to zoom in a little bit. So, there again, this top border of our fire rights community is the actual creek. Um, but mostly, what we're going to talk about is what's going on in Jordan, Jordan's Creek. Uh, and again, uh, there was an existing FRS radio group. Oh, oh, sorry. Family radio system is the walkie talkies you can get at Costco or on Amazon. Uh, and, and they're plenty fun and they're helpful at hikes and concerts and things like that where you have kind of clear line of sight. And, and when you when you get with Mark in the Aries training, he'll talk about what the technical limitations of are of those radios. Um, so we had an existing sort of DIY radio group, and I'll talk about it in a second. So if we can just go to the next slide. Okay, great. So Air Jordan, there's the sneaker. Uh, but it's because we're all basically everyone, with some exception, lived on Jordan Street, which is this street that heads out to the water treatment plant. So basically, they, this, this is a, a group that self-started a while back using these, let's just say, very available, um, but it's also somewhat limited um, walkie-talkies that you can get. But they they had started this group uh, even before I, I moved into the neighborhood. We had about these little, this was the best thing I could come up with, there was about 16 households that had were in the group, and we had contact information very similar to what Lorraine just described. You know, ways of getting a hold of each other, whether it's knocking on a door or or calling, texting, but, and or using the radios. Um, but just to be clear, that's fine. Uh, you know, so Air Jordan lives within the Deer Creek right Firewise community, and it's in some ways it's it's separate. And I think there was a, a thing within our Firewise community. That, this is a separate initiative. They're, as you well know, the neighbors of Give a Darn are the neighbors of Give a Darn. So mostly it's all the same people, but it was a, a separate a separate initiative, just to be clear, uh, for organization purposes. So why do we want them? Well, people understood the need already, right? That was that was clear. Uh, and we had a little bit of a network in place. People already talking to each other. And I think based upon also what we learned with Aries, that's really important, actually. You have relationships with these people. You can already talk to them. They know who you are. You actually care about each other, or at least care about what's happening in the neighborhood. Um, but one of the meetings that I saw during the, in Mark's presentation, and I think they gave some case studies out in the town of Washington and some stuff, and it became really clear that we were also going to be limited. And, and that wasn't just from case studies, but also personal, personal experience. That's the next bullet is, you know, stuff broke. 
and it didn't work. And if you couldn't even text or call, or you couldn't get on, get ready in Nevada County, I mean, you couldn't do much. And so, unless you wanted to, you know, vote with your feet and walk out and knock on someone's door, it was really hard to, to talk to other people, know what was going on. Um, and we learned also through the area presentation what the shortcomings of the family, FRS, family radio systems were. Um, and then, so I think there was just a general desire for better tools and getting access to first responders to OES and a wider network of people. And we've done some tests and we can actually talk to people kind of far away, which is kind of cool. Um, and also one thing that motivated this and, and got me to sort of volunteer myself with it, the person who found it, Eric Jordan actually moved away out of the neighborhood. So there was just a void. And the guy who got handed to whatever that, that job was not very happy about it. And so I think I just felt like, well, you know, not me, who's gonna do it? So. I just raised my hand and <laughs> took it over. Um, so the current program status, and I, I call us a, a pod because again, like the, the Aries group is distinct from the Firewise community. It operates within it, but it's a separate group of people that have decided it. They wanted to do this. They wanted to put in the effort. They wanted, and they want to be available. Part of it is that you're going to show up when stuff gets ugly. So um, we did the training. Um, we had two actual activations, right? And I'm sure you know what those most likely were, but certainly the snow weather events and uh, uh, some fire stuff. We also tested what I call passive the torch or succession, which I'm really big into, is that we're, no one's in charge. It's very flat, right? And so, because if I'm out of town or I don't feel so hot or whatever, everything to, to Lorraine's point too, it's like, we all got to be able to, to step up when needed. So how to pass the torch, who's going to be the net controller or kind of the hub of the wheel, who's going to be the, the, the person to contact other folks. So um, we've had some good tests, but there's more to be done. So I have a, these are my action items. This was good for me. So thank you, Casey, because <laughs> they reminded me of some to-dos. I have stuff to do. We have stuff to do in the community, which is kind of formalize the roster, just to keep communications going. Uh, we need to do some more tests, some more drills. Um, we need to integrate some of these households that decided not to upgrade. That's my little upgrade arrow. That's just your, your typical walkie-talkie you can get pretty much anywhere. This is the GMRS. That's the uh, general mobile radio system, right? So it's just a more powerful radio. Operates on similar frequencies, but it, it works better and goes farther. So um, we need to do some tests to integrate the people with the cheaper radios into our group. Uh, I want to do that. And then defining some, some protocols for supplemental actions. Great. You, we talked about it, but now what, right? Somebody needs help with their car or someone needs to get an ambulance or someone just doesn't need some information. So we got to practice what you do after you use the radio, get the information. It's now time to take action. So we need to practice that a little bit. And a couple other things, doing welfare checks on people who may not be have any kind of radio. Um, and also, this is a thing we learned too, particularly with the snow situation was, um, you know, we're boots on the ground. We can see that tree limb hanging on the power line. We know what's gonna happen in the next three days if we're getting another double weather. So to be proactive and go out and walk the neighborhood, we did that a couple of times. It didn't help much calling the PD, but what we tried. Um, and then other scenarios, I wanna do some texts too, where um, we try, you know, reaching over yes, or again, just some tech. So that's the current program. So I call us the Air Jordan Aries Boosted Radio Group now. So hope you like that, Mark. I just did a little upgrade on your logo. Um, so now we have of the 16 or so people, we now have people with both FRS and GMRS radios. And we actually, we, uh, we Shanghai someone from the Greater Champion Mind Group. So we've got someone across the creek and up the hill and we can get a hold of him too and he can talk to us. So I like the idea of other Aries groups starting to work together, sharing best practices, sharing things that don't work that well. I think that's a really great idea. Maybe it's a Facebook group or something and we can all talk to each other. Um, even if we want to do it on the radio. What's next? So what worked great was Aries offered us a great service, great information um, that worked. Um, getting purchase recommendations. Just here's the radios you should buy. And I highly recommend just get the more expensive one. It's a little more full future, full future. And it was great for training purposes because then no one's left out. No one's like, well, my radio doesn't do that, you know, or whatever. Well, that's just my personal opinion about that. 
Um, the trainings and the tests we did were it's actually kind of fun. Uh, and then they actually came in handy, it gave us confidence. Uh, and that was definitely proven during our latest snow event. Um, we got uh, uh, we got a chance to use them and we got a chance to pass the torch. So this is this is the picture I think that sums up what this could be like for you if you care to take it on, but it's well worth it, it's important to me. So uh, it was from like herding cats. And, and part of it too is to respect that Aries is a volunteer program, right? They're not getting paid to do this. So we need to respect their process and to interface with that when you got every, you know, all the neighbors have their own idea about what it is or what it shouldn't be. And it's just like, hey guys, this is the program. You're, are you on or off the bus? Really? So, um, and just making it clear, being a liaison in my case was helping to steer what the Aries pitch was or the Aries, Aries offering was to people who needed to understand what's the benefit, right? Because that's the first question to answer. Like, well, why should I spend the time? Well, here's why. Hey, you could save your life or you could save a friend's life or you could just help the community. Out. So I think that's important. And related to that is understand the process also. I think that's really important to convey to your, to your neighbors what's going to happen, how's this going to work. Um, and, and yeah, there's some steps you've got to follow, but we'll get to a, a good outcome. So um, I think we, we could have done a little better about, well, now we did the training, got the radios, we, we tested them, we practiced them, but now what? So I'd like to, to, to work on that a little bit and some guidance. And the last bullet I really is that I'm thinking of ways that, to make a training actually fun, practice fun. We could do radio treasure hunts or we could do whatever ways to actually just get, get the radios in people's hands to use them so they're comfortable and confident when, when you actually need so that's do I, have, do I have one more slide? I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's related to what I just said is just understand what's out there. And I think start at the website even just get educate yourself about what's the program before you even reach out to Mark. I think he does a great job. Um, identify someone, you know, some lucky soul as a single point of contact to work with Mark just to keep communications clear. Um, I personally use a little technology just to heard the cats, so to speak. I got people to fill out a little form online just to indicate interest so I can then get back to Mark and say, Here, here's the people who we hope will show up. Um, you can use Google Forms or a job form. And then the last one really is to be patient because you know, community organizing just takes a little bit of patience uh, and to be flexible because we had to accommodate, you know, it was like herding cats. You know, they had lots of people that would be great. So that, um, I think, is that it? One more slide. There you go. Thanks very much. And if anybody wants to talk to me about it more, I'm to be available. So thank you, Carrie. Yeah, Carrie. Okay, guys, one more to go, and it's yours truly. Um, very, very, very different scenario. So both Lorraine and Carrie, kind of Nevada City, near Grass Valley downtown, Memorial Park areas. Um, New Bet Firewise is New Bet Road. Am I doing this for work? No, I don't know if you did it or I did it. Um, will, will the thingy work? Okay. So similar to the other groups, our boundaries and how we define the Firewise community is, for us, it's pretty simple. It just turned out to be very large. Where's Ellen? Did you take off? Poor guy has had to do so many maps for us. Um, anyone who uses UBET Road to access their parcel is part of the UBET Firewise community. Sounds simple. In reality, what that translates to, next slide please, is that we have um, over 12,000 acres. We have over 700 parcels. Our neighborhoods, the previous map showed the color coding. Those are our neighborhoods as we've broken them down for neighborhood leaders. So we have between 18 and 20 neighborhoods. Um, each of those is the same size. This, they're firewise communities in essence. So we're running multiple complex systems within one firewise community. Um, neighborhood leaders, we have about 40 to 50 and over 1,200 people in the community itself. When um, I looked at this case study, I thought, you know, our challenges are a little bit different than some of the others. And so I just wanted to call out a couple of things. Lots of communities in, throughout Nevada County have one way and one way out roads. Ours is nine miles one way and anchored by Peninsula Campground. So the complexity for those of you who live around Scott's Flat and other areas, summertime, RVs, day trippers with boats, 
all of our windy road and so forth, right? So that's anchoring. That's the end of our nine mile road. There are no alternate evacuation routes. There's some little offshoots for four wheel drive seasonally, blah, blah, blah. There's no alternate evacuation route. You best did. Um, we have residents because of the, the complex and difficult and diverse terrain. We have a lot of residents who do not have landlines and do not have cell coverage. Period. Not just when the power goes out. <laughs> period. So communication has from day one, when I started doing firewise, I was like, how do you communicate? And people were telling me about the 1990s fire, you know, the, the bone trees. And I always said, how'd that work? They go, oh, it didn't even work back then. So we really have had no communication system. Um, the last piece I do want to call out two things is that within the community of UVet, we have a lot of fire starts. They don't make it to UVenet. You probably don't know about them. We track them 15 alone in 2022. What that means is our community, based on our CAL FIRE and our firefighter partners, have told us in our community, we are the first in on every single fire, 100% of the time. There's not one fire for the last three years that a UVet resident has not been first in. So think about what that means in terms of communication and what should we be doing and problems and all these kinds of things. The last piece is with that road nine miles, should I stay or should I go? The fear that all of us have up there is that somebody's going to jackknife on the road, somebody is going to panic and break down, go over the side, and if there's a wildfire and there's embers and there's smoke and you can't see it, you don't want to leave and get caught up in that. So that's our challenges. Next slide, please. So we were literally doing cartwheels when we found out from OES that Aries was ready to go because we'd heard about it the year before. And um, Drew and Mark Mazer, who's also with Aries, was a new vet, um, reached out to us and we didn't hesitate. We, we said right away, you have a program, we're in, what is it? Just, you know, silver platter this for us <laughs> and we're ready to go. So one thing that we have um, really focused on because of the size and complexity of our neighborhoods is that our first objective, our first primary objective was how do we get information, um, whether it's the Greenhorn River, the Bear River, down here to Rollins Lake, and we come in at 174 in Ubet. How do we get information on the fires that are threatening our community? And how do we get to make sure that we've got eyes on the fire, regardless if it's coming from Dutch Flat or the river fire coming from Rollins Lake or coming across from lower Colfax? So the idea was we wanted to put radios in the hands of people who could provide information to the rest of us living there as to what that situation is so we know if we can use the road to evacuate. So that was our number one objective. So me being me, um, kind of looked at this as, are you geographically important? We also wanted our firewise neighborhood leaders to have the radios. And people who are clear, calm, and competent, you guys were saying, it's one thing to chit chat on the radios, it's another thing to do so when some, when, excuse me, but when the shit's going down, right? Okay, next slide, please. Um, so this was me out of the gates. We won't spend any time on it, because my thought was, oh, with these radios, we can have the core group on a channel, and then every you know, neighborhood blocks can have another channel and they can communicate within their own. Fast forward to the next slide. Drew and I go out and did what they call range checks, which basically means two people drive around in their car with the handheld radios and talk to each other to see where, if they can get clear communication. And Carrie mentioned line of sight. These radios are designed to work. I can see you, we can talk, right? If I can't see you, you probably can't. So what we learned, this is just an example, is um, Vaughn Hill is one example. We spent it over almost a whole day going up and down roads from Ubed at one at Vaughn Hill to the end of Vaughn Hills, less than a mile. We couldn't hear each other at all. And the same for every other one of our offshoots. Mm -hmm. So it was a complete disaster. Next slide. So that idea, that plan got tossed away. Next slide. <laughs> so. You guys have heard, um, Carrie mentioned the Banner Mountain repeater. And everyone's like, what's a repeater? And when the team started talking to me about repeaters, I was like, la, 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 la. I don't like technology. I freak out with this stuff. I just want to hold, hold the radio and know it works. Guess what? It's not that hard. It's one, two, three. The repeater basically is a gigantic antenna that sits up at a high point and allows a person with radio A to say something 
that big antenna takes it and repeats it to the person with radio B. It's seamless. So literally all it's doing is taking away that line of sight requirement and basically bouncing that message over to those folks. So long-term I had said, oh, we'll get a grant as a Firewise community. Um, I was hearing $3,500 to install this repeater. Um, we started using the Banner Mountain repeater. We've got so many people, they've got so many people. It was chaos. I fortunately have a partner, Mike, who took to this like a duck to water. Next thing you know, he has, back up one place. Um, he has created and installed a repeater on our house, because I'm at a high point, in time for the peak fire season last year. And that allowed us to then program the radios in such a way that every single person in UBET works off of the UBET repeater. We literally, if you go back to that map at the beginning, every single person in our community can we can talk to them. That is unbelievable. I mean, I still get chills when, I, when it happens. And when we didn't have the repeater, we were relayed. I was like, okay, there's Rose down at Peninsula and Brad's up on New Deal and Red Dog and so on Chalk Club and you're down on Bot Hill. And it was like, I was a dispatcher, right? So this has just been seamless for us and it's not for everyone, but it's been pretty amazing for a community like ours. It's got that kind of size. Um, so since then, um, we've, we've successfully launched the program. Um, I think the, the stats that we have are about 35 households and, and uh, 50 residents. Um, that was sort of the key point for us in terms of what worked. We obviously echo what these guys were saying about decision-free working with areas. We didn't want to research the radios, although I'll tell you there were guys in my community who literally went out and did their own research anyway and came back sheepishly like, yeah, Aries was right, but I hope you feel better, but people do what they need to do. Um, radio checks and the, the range testing, that's ground truth, right? So you, I had this big pie in the sky kind of concept in terms of how this would work. Reality is you just got to get out there and, and drive around and see what works. Identify a tech team. For those of us who aren't, um, there's a lot of people who are. And so we have a new bet Quite a few folks who have had background in this, who are coming out of woodwork and participating. So we don't need to rely on ARIES as we continue to roll this out. Um, absolutely do the net controls and encourage people who are shy, tell them it's okay. I've gone to taking, like every time we do a net control, we do a tip of the week. People forget how to switch from channel one to channel two. They forget push to talk. They forget you have to actually you know, push the button before you talk. So you'll get a mid sentence. So we constantly are rehearsing the basic things and telling everyone it's okay. These are practice sessions and that's why we do them. No event too small to rehearse. We have used these radios because we started last summer. The fires, Peninsula campground fires, the Dutch flat fire. We've had, I can't tell you how many like trailers blowing up on wildlife lane in the middle of the night. We've had so many opportunities to actually put these things into play. Also, somebody's horse has escaped and all the people are on the radios talking about the horse and where is it? I'm checking over here. And people thought it was like a game of treasure hunt, but it was live and it's a horse. Um, so that's fun. Have, so here's the thing, have a plan, but then be flexible. Um, too much control is too much and, and that's on me. Let it grow organically. Uh, Mark was there, I have my plan. Meeting number one, meeting number two, people start showing up at my house. I don't know who they are. I mean, they're literally just coming to the meeting, and I'm like, oh my God. And I realized, let it grow. If folks want to get engaged, they're interested, and they have a passion, you're in. <laughs> so much for my little map, and who's going to be and stopping at your house and so forth. Um, continue to promote the program. This is something that I think is very effective. So when we had our annual meeting in July, had our Firewise booth, had a lot of other booths, many of you in this room were there as well, but we actually had a separate booth just for the radios. So people who wanted to ask questions could go and when they signed up for you that Firewise, they could check the box that said, are you interested? And that was a trigger for me to do a follow up and invite them to the radio training. Next slide, please. So brings us up to where are we for 2023? Um, I like to say we rock, we didn't do it alone, had a lot of support. Um, tonight, tonight's uh, to me an, an awareness opportunity. 
whether people are here in person or whether we take the videos that Jeff does afterward and share them with our communities. It's a way to use this information to, to share and, and get folks excited about it. For you bet, um, we, went, we went dormant throughout the winter. People logged on or got on the radios for Snowmageddon and so forth, but we weren't doing weekly nets, net control where you get on and practice. We're kicking them off this coming Sunday, the first Sunday of May. And we do them weekly because of the frequency of the events that happen in our community. Um, and also, you know, I'm absolutely to tell people, you don't have to come every practice. Try to make at least one a month. And that way, there, you know, you got your core group of people who are going to be there no matter what, but it gives everyone a system to tap into. The other thing I'll say is when we have an event happen, a fire or something else, um, we go right, airplanes up, radios on, so we hear the, the planes coming out of Grass Valley air attack. And if it's something that's actually there and not threatening us, we do updates on the hour. So when the Dutch flat fire was happening, and that's a mile off of Chalk Bluff, which then you know comes into us every hour on the hour. What do you know? What did you hear? What do you see? And so forth. Um, the neighborhood leaders, we had our quarterly meeting recently. They've all been tasked with. Uh, recruiting folks in their neighborhoods for the for the radius. We're we're at 35 households. We need to be double that. We need to be double that before peak fire season. Um, so we have a training schedule, June 10th. You bet folks who are interested in the radios, it's scheduled, it's done. We do them at Paradale Chicago Park Firehouse. We've already got four confirmations and I haven't even published it yet. And then last enhancements like you guys were talking about. So that, that wonderful repeater that Mike Bandy had put on our house. <laughs> I was in Mexico when the snow began and the power outage was there. He was out of power for 12 days and he's like, oh my God, I just realized the radio doesn't work without power. He had to go to a neighbor's house, borrow a generator, hook it up separately so the thing would go. And people were like, why aren't the radios working? So our next step is we're gonna get a solar operated something or other. I don't know what that is. As that tech expert. <laughs> um, and then like you guys, we want to do a group text because we found that a lot of people, you know, when they're traveling and so forth, they may not have that information and just to, an event is occurring, radio's on, right? So I, I do agree with personal responsibility, but there's times and places where you got to give people a little nudge to participate. Next slide. Not going to go through these, just letting you know the neighbors are passionate about this. So for my close, what I want to say is that this has truly been um, the best thing I've encountered from a FireWise leader perspective to get neighbors engaged. Everything else we've done has been good. This has been great. So I encourage everyone to think of it from that perspective. You know, and people that live behind their 30 acres up in you bet, you never see them. We don't get eye contact with neighbors. All of a sudden they're coming out. They're like, I don't want to be, a, I don't want to, you know, participate in any kind of a club, but boy, they're on that call every Sunday night. <laughs> <laughs> so um, lots and lots of positive feedback, including, you know, just say like from Katie and her husband Clayton, the Abbots, they were one of the first parcels built out in the 1980s. And you bet, you know, these are long-term residents whom I had never met before. And so there's, it's like, it's a tool to get the new folks as well as the folks who've been there and think that they don't need help. And I think it's bringing this all together. Um, with that, it's my team's email address in case anyone wants to follow up. And next one. And now we turn it over to Susan, her resource of the month. And she's actually gonna be um, showing how you can access the documents that Lorraine put together and so generously shared. Um, for all of our advice communities to use. Susan, take it away. Okay, so on our website, website of the coalition, the Firewise Communities, we always have the page called Four Firewise Community Admins. And on that page, at the top, we have some things about risk assessment and, and uh, for those groups that have to do that, educational resources, then we have the day-to-day -day communication, and then in the red letter, we've got preparing for emergency communication. And a little bit about a buddy system that came uh, a few years ago that can be helpful, but if you want or need a more robust way of keeping residents connected, then we have what we've talked about here today. And when the video goes up, the video of tonight's meeting will be right here. 
Uh, here are the two previous videos of previous meetings we've had on the emergency communications. Um, Carrie referred to one of those. And then uh, here are the links, both here and here, to the website of the ARIES group. And the uh, documents that Lorraine prepared for her group, and they are all in Microsoft.format are right here. Digital dual display guide. These will download to your computer. They don't open in a browser. I'll open one of them just to show you. Um, these, these are docs, and you might just, I'm sure you won't care if people borrow them, right? It's, it's not a doc. You can just download them and change the name here. So I'm going to open this one right here and show you what quick guide to the radio specs looks like. Once we have word on it. Whoops. <laughs> Sorry about that. You download? Right, you I did. your Microsoft. Yeah, you're right. Um, there we go. No, it's not showing me. Matt Wallen's office. Okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on. It's coming. It's coming here. There it is. Here so here's the document prepared by Lorraine for Bowl Hill. And it's a guide to the radio. It tells you what all the different buttons do. This is just wonderful, right? Thank you very much. Yeah, it's pretty. A little uh, key to all of the buttons and everything. <laughs> and so you could just get this. If you start this <laughs> for your own Firewise community, you could just get this for yourself, change the name right there to your Firewise community, and then it's yours. So that is all on the website of the coalition under four uh, firewise admins. Thank you. Mark? Just one quick comment. Um, it, Lorraine has done a great job with all of this, but I don't want that document to scare anyone. The radio training that Aries does is completely non-technical. And if you can run your cell phone, you can run the radio. You don't need to know what any of those commands do. All you need to do is turn the radio on and you're good to go. So just wanted to add that in. That, that's a great point. And I think, um, when Lorraine sent me these documents, it's been a while, and I look at them as cheat sheets or a follow-up to people who've already gone through it, and I was like, that's such a great idea, you know, because I'm that person where I don't need that, but a lot of folks do, and that's why we did our weekly our weekly tips and stuff, but yeah, so onboarding is one thing, but reinforcement, once you're onboarded, is just another thing. Um, so open it up, I don't know who's going to Okay, so does anyone have any questions here in the room? Any comments, any observations, things that you'd like to ask about? You were here for the radios. What'd you what'd you think? Um, very good presentation. I'm excited, particularly about what you said about how it brings people together. Um, the communication is uh, so very important. It's about everything else. It's saving our lives, saving our animals and, and, and property, and communication is gonna be the thing that makes the difference. Yeah. And um I believe that this radio is a key component. The next step, I'm a little overwhelmed. With that. Yes. We get people on board, get us trained, the equipment in hands, and that's how you use it. Yeah, that's a great point. I, um, <clears throat> I, I hear all this and I know that it's excellent. And I think of one particular woman who was very isolated during the second March snowstorm. And um, to introduce her and get her to warm up to using a radio, the first thing she'll go to is money. And so our, what, what, did, what does this equipment cost and what are Firewise communities doing to help people be able to get this equipment? You wanna take that mark? Yeah, the cost per family is between 135 and $185 for everything done, yeah. And are you guys still offering the discount for veterans? Yeah, and if there, you have a disabled veteran um, who wants to pursue this, uh, we're offering to pay 50% of that cost okay. out of our pockets. I, I can speak on our behalf. Um, everyone's purchased their own radios, and our Far West community doesn't have a budget, so there's nothing we can do for them. But some of us have looked at that strategy map, and we do have some people we know that are critical to our success. And, we are purchasing radios to try to get them on board because for us, it's more important that that property with eyes on the, the, a dark spot, if you will, that that radio can light that up for us. That helps all of us. So, you know, you get 10 families 
ship it in 12 bucks and it's done. Any other comments or questions? Just a, a comment again, please don't be overwhelmed. There's a tendency to kind of go, whoa. And Carrie and Lorraine and Casey did point out it is hurting cats. But if we have a conversation at the beginning, I can bring things down to bare bones for you. I think I'll all attest to a 20 minute conversation will save you hours and allow us to both focus on what needs to be done and how to do it. Because I've got a lot of experience and having worked with those eight neighborhoods, I can kind of use that experience to help you get through it as easily as possible. There's still work involved for sure. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think it's overwhelming if if there's a good fit. I don't think it's overwhelming. Good fit. Meaning, do you have the people that can do this? Is the geography correct? Um, is the neighborhood close enough together that we can make contact with each other? So those couple things. Yeah. And I just to follow on that, I think when I said bringing people together, I talked about how long people would live, live there. <laughs> and you bet we have very distinct types of communities. The, the kind of low rangers who, you know, they're hermits. We've got the older retired folks. We've got a lot of independents. We have a huge younger community, mostly cannabis. And we've been able through this program to successfully get one or two people out of each of those to act as influencers within those communities. And that has been a big win. Um, we're getting people involved who previously weren't in any shape or form. Um, not to say they weren't working on their property, but this communication isn't about defensible space. This radio is about how the hell do we live and survive a wildfire in our community. So that's, it, I think it's universal. <laughs> so, okay, with that, um, the, our next meeting uh, quarterly is July 11th in Truckee. And I think Susan, you'll be hosting that if I'm not mistaken. No, Nate Christensen Nate. and Chucky yeah. will. Okay, so it'll be a hybrid meeting. So all of the uh, Western County people who don't want to drive to Truckee can just zoom in. Yep, so it'll still be Zoom or Zoom in, in person as well. Um, we have two folks on the steering committee now in Truckee. It's an, another Alex and uh, Nate. So Nate will be hosting the next meeting. So on behalf of the steering committee, the volunteers from the Fireways Coalition, Thank you all for attending tonight. Thanks to our special guests, Mark, Craig, and Carrie. You guys, appreciate it. I want to thank you for the time. Yay! Mary, I have a phone now.